Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another edition of the show and we've got the 2013 New Year's Eve special today. Uh, so we've got three sparkling wines. Now um, first let's just kind of go over sparkling, sparkling wine real quick. You don't have to only do these for celebrations. Okay, got that out of the way. All right, um, but since it's New Year's Eve and most people uh, tend to do the sparklies, the bubblies, whatever you want to call it, sparklers. Uh, for New Year's Eve. Um, I thought we would do that as I usually do every year. So I have three different wines. Um, these are from kind of all over the place. And uh, I've actually had a couple of these wines for a little while. So um, uh, we'll just, as I get to each wine, we'll kind of talk about it. But anyway, so we're going to start with uh, one wine here. Now, I've got the regular you know, I could probably do a better job of polishing the glass, but it's a clean glass, just not polished. It's okay. Anyway, make sure when you serve your wine to your guests, the glasses are polished. I don't even know if you can tell, but man, it's clean. Trust me. All right. So um, for evaluating the wine using this, however, the traditional way to serve it is with, again, a polished glass. Uh, but with a champagne flute. Now, you don't want the, the the really wide one because you can't, it, it just don't use those. Don't still use those. If you're going to use anything, use one of these then. Anyway, so for the evaluation of the wine, this way you really swirl it and you really get into it. While this does concentrate the, the aromas, I like the swirl. So we're just, to, for evaluation purposes, going to pour it in here. Now, all three of these wines have been uh, stored in a regular refrigerator uh, for at least overnight. Now, one of them has been stored for quite a while in the refrigerator, which is kind of funny which one it is. But, um, oh, it's yes, which one are we doing here? So let's start off with this one. This is the uh, Borgoluce uh, Val de Biadane uh, Prosecco Superiore, uh, DOCG. Um, so this is a Prosecco. So we got this from Italy. Uh, I bought this, well, actually, I didn't buy this. This one... If I remember correctly, because I don't remember buying it, uh, I believe this I actually got from uh, Bill Elsie over at Red Room Lounge uh, when I went to interview him that time. And uh, he was kind enough to just give me some kind of drinking wine. And I believe he gave me this, if I, don't, if I remember properly. Um, I don't know how much it is or if they're still selling it at Red Room Lounge, uh, but the average price on Wine Searcher was around $17. So let's kind of go over what a Prosecco is. So Prosecco um, is, well, Prosecco is the grape, or that's what it was called up until somewhat recently. Um, they, the, the grape didn't change. <laughs> they decided to say that Prosecco is more of a region in northern Italy, uh, north of Venice, um, or, or that area that the wine is made from, instead of saying that it's a grape. So it's kind of like champagne is the type of sparkling wine, but the grapes that you use to make champagne are one of three different grapes, or two or all three. So, um, but anyway, Prosecco is the old name for the grape, but now it's, uh, it's a grape called Glera, G-L-E-R-A. And honestly, today was the first time I even knew that that happened. Because I'm sitting there looking at all the stuff, and I'm like, Prosecco's the grape. And then I went, what, wait, it changed. Hmm. What happened? No one told me. It's okay. Um, but anyway, uh, most of it is made in the Cogliano Valle Biadene area. And Cogliano and Valle Biadene are the two towns in the uh, Treviso region of Italy. And this is north of the, 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 the uh, Veneto area of Italy, so we're talking northeast quadrant of Italy and uh, near Venice to give you a little more, uh, a larger town to think of. Uh, most of the Prosecco is made in this area 
um, in, in this, this part of, the, of that area. Um, and this particular, and most Prosecco is made in what's called the Charmat. I'm assuming it's called Charmat. I've never actually had anyone say the word in front of me. I don't think it's Charmat. But the uh, Charmat method, which means that the second fermentation happens in the stainless steel tanks rather than in the bottle. Now, uh, when we get to the champagne, we'll kind of talk about that a little bit more. Uh, actually, this is fermented in the bottle too. All right, so who is, who, who, who's, who's uh, Borgoluce? Okay, Borgoluce has been around, uh, this winery has been around for forever. It's probably one of the oldest winemaking families I've come across in a while. The land was given to them in either 958 or 959 AD. Um, and I forgot who gave it to him. I didn't put in my notes. Um, and they gave him a total of 3,200 acres. Now, not all 3,200 acres are used for vineyards. They have horses, sheep, cattle, swine, and sheep as far as livestock. Uh, they also produce meat, so they have salamis. Uh, they do flowers, not, not flowers that you grow, but like flour, like, like you make bread out of, uh, and cheese, among other things besides wine. So they have um, 160 acres dedicated to vineyards, and the rest of it, I guess, is basically farmland, which vineyards a farm, by the way, it's farmland, but other stuff, you know, cattle and all that kind of stuff. So, so they have uh, quite a bit of land over there, and they've been making wine for quite a while. Um, I didn't put down how, how when they started making the wine, but um, it's safe to say they've been making it they might have been making it since 959 AD, but uh, so they've had the land for quite a while. All right, so uh, let's check it out now. Prosecco, uh, again, this is uh, just another sparkling wine that's out of Italy. Um, it's popular in the sense that it's typically not as expensive as champagne. Uh, champagne tends, tends to be the most expensive of all the sparkling wine that you're going to buy. Uh, so when you're looking at equal levels of sparkling wine, champagne tends to be the most expensive. Uh, it doesn't have to be exorbitantly expensive. It's just, you know, I can get this bottle for 17 bucks and this bottle and this bottle for more. And I'm not saying that the quality is necessarily the same, but when you're kind of talking, you know, relative quality within, say, the Prosecco brand, this might be kind of the same level of Prosecco as this would be sparkling wine. Okay. Um, so, uh, and it's, it's, uh, Prosecco is, I'm sorry, Glera is the grape that Prosecco needs to be made from, uh, whereas other sparkling wines have either laws or no laws at all. You can make sparkling wine from really any grape that you want, but some grapes are probably better than others to make sparkling wine from. So let's get into this. Prosecco, I love Prosecco. Um, I love wine, so let's just put it that way. So let's check it out. Um, quick quick little fact, uh, first of all, see I've got all the things here. Um, one thing over the years of doing these specials is I've learned is to, I've sometimes would have all the bottles ready to open sitting here on the table and uh, I, I might leave them there for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. And because I've, und I've undone the wire, un you know, untwisted the wire for the, for the whatever the cage, uh, things pop up. Lucky, luckily, you can't really see it here, but I've got this little chandelier here with a bunch of little glass things, panels. Luckily, none of the glass is ever broken, but it's happened a couple times. And all these bottles were kind of violent today. Another reason to have the champagne today besides New Year's Eve. The Cowboys lost. Oh, I love it. Vikings won, too. Not that it matters. We only had five wins. We're not going anywhere. Here's the Jerry Jones's team losing. All right, so uh, Prosecco. Let's get back to that. Now, sparkling wines in general will have a lot of similarities among themselves, but some things will stand out with certain types of sparkling wine. With the Prosecco here, it's really just kind of I always feel like I can smell the effervescence of sparkling wine. It feels like, you know, I feel like I can smell the bubbles, no matter which, which one it is. But it, it's, it's, it's kind of apple and kind of pear-like. Um, I don't get a lot of, I don't get a whole lot of bakery 
though that is something that you will get out of sparkling wine is, is like that pastry or bakery, you know, fresh baked bread type of um, aromas. I don't necessarily get that as much with the Prosecco here. But there might be a little bit of that. Other than that, there's really not much else on the nose. So let's uh, check it out. Let's taste it. Mm. Well, one of the one of the things that, that kind of came across on this wine for me is like an almond flavor, um, and, and that's one of those weird things. Like you don't necessarily get almonds out of regular wines, but with sparkling wines, sometimes you do. Now there are some almond flavored sparkling wines that are out there. I know that some of the Texas wineries make them, and they're they're actually pretty tasty. I'm not a huge fan of almonds. I, I kind of like them, you know, every once in a while, but the the sparkling ones I've had from from those places. Uh, the almond ones actually tend to be my, my favorite of the flavored sparkling wines, which I, I do find interesting that I would find the almond ones the, the, the favorite of those. But um, again, still the, the apple and pear, again, not much bakery to it. The almond flavor is kind of gone. Maybe it's because I was thinking about the almond flavored champagnes and sparkling wines I've had. That made me think of that, but it's really light. Uh, acid's pretty good though. Um, I would probably call it like a medium, maybe medium plus acid, um, but it's real light. Um, being in a larger glass, you're not gonna see the bubbles. The, this really helps concentrate the bubbles. Um, so that's why it looks kind of boring, but um, you know, it's tasty. Uh, it's definitely good, like for a good 17, like 17 bucks, if you get around that price, it's a good value for sparkling wine, uh, especially if you're gonna have some people over and you want to um, have something that's gonna be easy drinking, it's gonna be pleasant, uh, people are going to enjoy it. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're gonna like it, they're gonna like it. I mean, most sparkling wine, unless you're drinking the really, really bad stuff, um, it's, it, everyone's gonna be like, oh, this is awesome, especially in a celebration type of thing. I mean, I'd be the guy at the party going, evaluating it, so. I mean, there is a bit of nuttiness to it still. So it's got some really good flavor. It's not, it's not an explosion of flavor. Um, it's real pleasant. It's definitely something you can drink on its own. You don't need food with this wine. Um, Remember, these are wines, okay? Um, you know, it's, it's really tasty, but it's not like an over-the-top sparkling wine. So I would definitely say, you know, for, for 17 bucks, it's a good value if you see it on the shelf somewhere. Uh, definitely, you can get it. Um, and I think you'll, you'll be happy with it. But I, I do feel, I, I'm pretty sure that these two wines are gonna probably be better not value necessarily, but better wines, at least for my palate. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to hit the uh, microphone there. Uh, no spit bucket tonight. Because we're gonna be drinking this. Matter of fact, I'm probably gonna be finishing off one of these bottles tonight while I'm editing all this so I can get this up by the 30th, because that's tomorrow. All right, so um, let's move on to the next wine. Okay, so the curtain should be doing that right here, okay. Um, so the next wine, this is a wine that um, I actually bought for the, for the show uh, when I bought the Christmas wines a, a few, uh, about two, three weeks ago. Uh, I sent, sent out a tweet and I was like, quick, in 15 minutes, give me suggestions for Christmas wine. One person replied, but it's okay. It was in the middle of the afternoon and not everybody's watching their Twitter feed on a, like a Wednesday. But um, somebody did suggest this and I, I wish I had remembered who, who did suggest it. Um, but anyway, so she suggested the Schramm, Schramsberg Blanc de Blanc. Now Schramsberg, this particular wine, I know I've had uh, several times actually uh, at Max's because this is one of the wines they sell. Now, 
I'm pretty sure I've had the Blanc de Blanc. All I know is I've just said, that I just asked him about some sparkling wines. They go, how about Schramsberg? I'm like, that sounds good to me. So, um, but I'm pretty sure it's the, I've had this one. This is a vintage. And we're going to talk about that in a second. 2010, uh, Schramsberg Blanc de Blanc. Now, this one I did buy at Total Wine and More. Uh, it's listed at $28.99 with the six-pack discount. It came out to $26.09. This bottle's really heavy. I think this one was the most, no, actually this one was the most violent when I opened it of, of all of them. But all of them, man, that, I've opened up other sparkling wines in the past and they've never, and it's never felt like they really were pushing the cork out, but this was. Um, but yeah, I, this one was in the, I had this one in the fridge overnight. So uh, check it out, nice golden color too. Now this, uh, this particular wine or winery uh, was, well, first of all, the person who found it, his name is Jacob, Jacob, Jacob Schramm. Okay, he's from Germany, uh, born in 1826. And uh, when he was 16, so that would have been when he was around, around 1842, depending on when he turned 16. Um, I'm sorry, he was from the town, the German town of Fettersheim. Fettersheim and he, his family is actually was a winemaking family back in Germany. So at 16, he immigrated to the United States. He went to New York, uh, and he actually learned to be a barber. So he didn't go to New York to make wine. Uh, eventually, over time, he found his way over to Napa Valley. Uh, in 1852, he eventually settled in the Napa Valley area. Uh, or he moved in, in 52, he moved to San Francisco. And at some point in time... <coughs> Um, settled in the Napa Valley. Uh, in 1862, he purchased land in Napa Valley uh, and created Schramsberg. Now, there were a lot of Germans in the area uh, buying up land and uh, probably, you know, the hilly parts of Napa probably reminded them of the hilly parts of the winemaking areas of Germany. Um, uh, they're not exactly the same, but they probably gave them some remembrance of it. But, uh, after he purchased the land and was getting the, the place started to make for you know, growing vines and all that, he was still a barber, okay? Um, so as they were developing it uh, and the business prospered, they also created an underground cellar. And uh, uh, his wife, Annie, was um, very involved with the whole process of everything. Uh, I think she was the one that was more in charge of the underground cellar creating it. Uh, so they had they had the property for a long time. They were making regular wine. They weren't making any sparkling wine. They're making regular still wine with a from a bunch of different varietals. Um, they were using Zinfandel, Riesling, Sauvignon Vert, which is you know not not a very popular grape anymore. Or I don't know if it was popular back then, but it's not a popular grape necessarily uh, worldwide. Uh, and they were it says they also made a Burgundy and Sauternes style of wine. Um, and they also mentioned Hock on their website. Well, Hock is just a generic term from a German white wine. So I'm not sure if a Burgundy was just they had like a light red wine or they actually were using Pinot Noir. Um, and what they were talking about a Sauternes style of wine. I don't know if they actually were having Botrytis in the vineyards or they were just making a sweet white wine. Um, but anyway, so they, but they were producing wines of that type uh, back in the 18 and 1900s. Um, in 1901, uh, his wife Annie passed away. In 1905, Jacob passed away. And his son Herman uh, was running everything. And then he eventually sold uh, the property to a company called Sterling Investments in 1912. Uh, and around this time, there was there were some issues with Prohibition and with uh, Phylloxera, actually, in the Napa Valley. So business wasn't doing so well, so he sold it off. Over time, over the next, like, 50 years or so, uh, different people bought it and sold it and bought it and sold it. Uh, 1965, um, Jack and Jamie Davies bought the property and uh, they bought 200 acres of it. And um, was is this, place? yeah, this was the 200 acres, yeah. So um, I thought I did put that in there. Anyway, it was two, they bought 200 acres of it and they began producing sparkling wines. Now, um, and they started using what's called the Champagne Method or the Method Champenois. Um, now that is where the second fermentation happens in the bottle. And we haven't covered second fermentation yet, so let's do that now. All right, so 
Second fermentation. So we hear that a lot with like, especially like Chardonnay. So there's a second fermentation. So that, that malolactic fermentation. Okay. So those, those terms are, are bandied around and kind of used at the same time. The second fermentation for, um, for champagne or sparkling wine is not a, it's not the malolactic fermentation. It is another fermentation, uh, that is done either in a, a vat, like a steel tank, like this wine, like the Prosecco, sometimes done in a barrel, uh, and sometimes done in, uh, in a bottle. Now, some sparkling wines, they just inject CO2. Okay. So there isn't necessarily a second fermentation to it. This is the really, really cheap, cheap, like you really shouldn't drink the stuff. You just pass it off as freebies at a party. That's the stuff they just inject CO2. So fermentation in the bottle is a more expensive way of creating this stuff because in the tank, everything's just fermented and they keep everything under pressure and then they, they age it for however long they age it in the tank and then they, and then they bottle it under pressure and then they're all good to go. Whereas when you do it in the bottle, you, you, uh, um, everything ferments, then you put in the bottle, you put a little bit of extra sugar in there. Um, so the yeast can go back to work and you seal it and that, however long that takes. And then you have to, you have to, um, disgorge the, there's like a little, um, what we do is you, you, the bottle eventually gets, uh, upside down and you freeze the neck, uh, however you want to do it. There's various ways to do it. And what that does is it, it, it freezes part of the wine and then you take, there's like a bottle cap, like a, like a, um, beer bottle cap that's on the bottle. You take that off and this little bit of frozen wine pops out. Maybe a little bit of unfrozen wine pops out. Then sometimes they put a little bit of wine back in. Sometimes they put um, maybe a little bit of sweeter wine or sugar back in to give it uh, a little bit of sweetness to it. Uh, and then they bottle it back up, okay, with the, with these corks. So now you've got the six pounds of, sorry, six atmospheres of pressure in the bottle. And so what it does is that the second fermentation of the bottle basically gives each bottle has a characteristic instead of just like a generic thing. Um, and it's just, you know, fancy, fancier way basically. But um, it really does add to the characteristics of the wine and it's more expensive because the bottles, no matter what, the bottles have to be very strong. But since you're fermenting in the bottle, you got to make sure that everything's good. So um, that's what the... Uh, champenois or method champenois is or champagne method um, and uh, these people were uh, if I remember right were the first they they were the well this Blanc de Blanc was the and this is they started in 1965 with this was the first sparkling wine produced by them and was the United States firstly first commercially produced Chardonnay based brute sparkling wine so my guess is that there was probably sweeter sparkling wine that might have been Chardonnay based or other grape based prior to them. But this was basically a, a Blanc de Blanc, a champagne style wine. This was the first commercially produced one in the United States. Um, they also produce vintage champagne or sorry, sparkling wine. Um, and this is 2010. So vintage, let's kind of go over that real quick since we're kind of delving into a little more stuff. Um, in Champagne, they will declare a vintage. Now, not they as a collective. Now, each house can say, hey, the harvest was a really, or the vintage was a really exceptional harvest, a really exceptional vintage. Um, and they can say, well, we're going we're gonna to call it a vintage. And I'll go over the, when we get over the Moet, we'll, we'll do that. Um, and then if they don't think the harvest or the vintage was exceptional, they'll call it a non-vintage. Um, Schramsberg seems to put out a vintage almost every year. It looked like on their website, they skipped a year. I think it was 2000, 2000 or 2001. It looked like they didn't have notes for the Blanc de Blanc. So whether there was no vintage for that year or they just didn't have, um, a PDF of the wine, I don't know, but it looks like they basically have a vintage every year. Um, so I'm not sure if, if they're just doing vintages just to do them or, they're just saying, hey, Napa Valley has a pretty consistent harvest every year, which they do. Uh, that's one of the reasons why people love growing grapes in Napa Valley or that, that part of the world, uh, because vintages are pretty, I mean, they're, they're, 
I mean, you have some variation, you have some vintages is better than others, but the weather there, the climate is pretty consistent from year to year. Whereas in a lot, even places like France and Italy and Germany, you can have one year that things are awesome and one year things are horrible, okay? And living in Texas, you, uh, you, I've experienced that too. So um, again, I don't know if it's just they just like to produce vintage wine or every year is just basically exceptional except for maybe a one or two. So let's go back into this. So it's a Chardonnay base. So uh, definitely the color's different. It's really gold in color. I mean, if you didn't see this, if you didn't see the bubbles, you would think it was just a, a Chardonnay. We talked about the bakery. So it's here. And that seems to be really part of Chardonnay based sparkling wines or sparkling wines have Chardonnay in them. But definitely some bakery. Not quite sourdough, but you know, definitely uh, like you know, your bread's proofing. It's not really necessarily done. It's that, it's that you know, pre-baked or just now baking bread. Again, I still can feel like I smell the bubbles. I can feel the effervescence coming through the nose. There's a bit of creaminess to it. Apricot. You know, I'm definitely getting more of aromas out of this. Not to say almond, maybe a little almond, but I would say apricot more than anything else, which is typical. I wouldn't say I'm necessarily getting a lot of apple or pear. Don't really get any floral out of it. Let's taste it. It's just tasty, flat out, it's tasty. It's a $28 bottle of champagne, I'm sorry, sparkling wine. And I'm usually really good at making sure I, I specify what's sparkling, what's champagne. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty good bottle of sparkling wine. Um, it, it's got a lot of people that love it. Honestly, up until, I guess this year-ish or so, I'd never heard of them, which I feel stupid that I hadn't heard of them. Um, but um, it's got a really good mouthfeel to it. Um, I said the acid is a little bit higher um, on the palate. Um, I, I get more of the pear and apple flavors to it. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily, yeah, maybe a little citrus, a little citrusy, like a little lemon kind of. Um, not as much bakery. Hmm. Maybe a little bit more initially on the bakery, but it doesn't stay there very long. And kind of like a green apple, like like a little tartness to it, a little green apple, almost like a green like those green apple candies, like those little those little like rectangular candies you get. I can't remember who makes them, um, but yeah, like a green apple. It's you know nice and tart, uh, good acid. It's real tasty. Um, like I said I've had the brand before. Make sure I had the actual label facing out. Um, I've had the brand before, um, and I'm probably I've probably had the 2010, and I know I've liked it. So I definitely recommend this. If you find this in the store, buy it. All right. Now champagne. All right. So this is the Moet and Chandon uh, Imperial Brut. This is non-vintage, like the Prosecco is non-vintage. Uh, this wine I've had since June. It's been in the fridge since June. So first of all, a regular refrigerator isn't necessarily the best place to have long-term storage. I wouldn't call six months necessarily long-term, but long-term storage for a wine because of all the vibration. Uh, plus you're, you're talking 30 something degree Conditions and you're really not supposed to store wine at that level, but champagne really is supposed to be served really cold anyway. So if you want to leave it in the fridge, whatever. Um, I bought this. Oh, by the way, it is Moet. For any of you that think I just pronounced it wrong, I can tell you that I was part of the camp that thought it was Moe because it's French and ends in E-T. Well, see that little, those little two dots? The umlaut means you don't pronounce it Moe. Um, 
I used to make fun of people that said Moet, where I worked once. And then one day I found out they were the people that were pronouncing it right. It's kind of like thinking that, uh, you know, people said Merlot or Cabernet. And you're like, Haha, they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, but in this case, those people did know what they were talking about. Anyway, so Moet and Shandon. So who are they? Well, they're kind of one of the big guys. They're kind of one of the big deals in Champagne. Um, they've been around. <coughs> they've been around since 1743. They were founded by a gentleman named Claude Moet, uh, and I didn't get where the Chandon got from, came from. But um, and actually, I only really on their website, they don't really kind of they don't really mention it. Their their website itself was pretty sparse on some stuff. It's a lot of fluff, a lot of you know how great Champagne is, and not really a. I mean. I'm not saying there's nothing there, but it wasn't as detailed as some other other um, as some other websites. However, as far as this particular champagne, um, I did get some great information about uh, how they make it. So they source the grapes from. There's five major areas of the Champagne area. I'm not going to go through all of them, um, but uh, there's five major areas of Champagne. Uh, and they get the grapes from all over. They have they they have contracts or they have control over lots of plots of land or crews in Champagne, and uh, this is normal for a lot of Champagne houses. Now some place now I'm not going to go through all the little the little symbols, and I, I always have a hard time finding the little um, two letter. It was like a two letter what you call it that's supposed to be on every freaking bottle and. I'll be honest, I can't remember the last time I ever found this two-letter abbreviation that tells you what kind of champagne house it is. But um, you have people that, you know, they're the grower and they, they grow their own grapes and they make all the champagne from their grapes. And you have other ones that are negotiants and they, they collect a bunch of grapes and blah, blah, blah. And sometimes they, they own some of the vineyards, sometimes they don't. So, um, so Moet has a bunch of vineyards that they have either control over maybe they own some of them but the website doesn't say they own any of them just as they have control um so they have 200 of the 323 crews uh including 17 grand crew and they have 32 of the 44 premier crew so they got a lot of good stuff that they can get or a lot of good vineyards they can get uh, grapes from imperial was created in 1869 um, and Moet's one of the kind of, I want to say the founders of Champagne or the Champagne style, but they're one of the people that really like heavily marketed it and like got it out to the international world. Um, so, you know, they like to, they like to take credit for a lot of things there. They take credit for, uh, supplying wine to, to the Le Mans, 24 hour Le Mans and whatever winner in 1960 something was the one who's like shook the bottle and sprayed everybody. So they're crediting them, their champagne as being that. And uh, they also said that their champagne was the one that was the first to christen a ship. So, you know, there's, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but let's just say that they're a big brand and they've been around and people love them. Um, I mean, Napoleon loved them. Okay. So yeah. Uh, I think, I think they said that his troops, uh, and Napoleon would, you know, give the, the champagne to his troops. And during some victory, whatever, the sabering of champagne was apparently related or, or attributed to Napoleon or at least that era that they would open the bottles that way to celebrate a victory. No, I'm not sabering, obviously, any of these. So I think one day I'll try that. Outside in the backyard or maybe out front in the, uh, in the street where I can find the... The top of it because I don't want to step on it in the back. Anyway, um, so uh, like I said, it's their main house style. So let's kind of talk about house style real quick. We we'll talk about a little bit of legalese with champagne. You know? um, first of all, they said they create this out of 100 different wines. So what happens is that they get all these grapes together and they, they ferment them and blah blah blah. Um, this particular Moet, the, the Imperial, is made from all three of the grapes from Champagne. So you have Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, and uh, Chardonnay. And about 30 to 40 percent, so this is non-vintage, so 30 to 40 percent is Pinot Noir, and they say that that gives you the body for the Champagne. Uh, 30 to 40 percent is Pinot Meunier, that gives you the suppleness. And then 20 to 30 percent would be Chardonnay, and that gives you the finesse. Um, that's how they describe it. But that's basically 
each each grape contributes something to it. It's like any other blend of grapes. Certain things give it structure. Some things give it body. Some things, some things gives it tannin. Some of it gives it whatever. All right. Um, four and, and they say that twenty to thirty percent of 20 to 30% of, of the wine in the bottle is from what we call reserve wine. And they make a kind of a big deal of it. Well, folks, it's kind of a legal requirement that they have to hold back a certain percentage of the wine for a reserve wine because they produce vintage and non-vintage wines. Okay? So first of all, they have to hold back a, a, a certain percentage. That is at least 20%. So no more than 80% of a vintage's harvest. Okay, so when they harvest all the grapes... If they are a place that produces vintage and non-vintage, um, they can't use 20% of that harvest they have to hold off and use as a reserve wine. And these reserve wines, and they can have multiple years, by the way, of reserve wine. So they could have five years of wine to, that they did one fermentation and they, didn't, and they stopped it and they didn't do the second fermentation yet. And they hold these wines, and this is how houses have house styles. And this is kind of like blending scotch, I think, before I go down that path. I don't really know a whole heck of a lot about scotch, but I know they blend scotch, and they try to make sure it has a same, similar flavor from, I guess, year to year, batch to batch to batch, and they blend bunches of different scotches. Well, they do the same thing with the champagnes. They, these, these guys are like masters in trying to create the same flavor, which is it's kind of funny how people talk about you know, with vintage wine, oh, well, this vintage is awesome, this vintage is blah, blah, blah. But with champagne and non-vintage champagne specifically, they try to make it taste the same every year. The whole, you know, this is kind of my whole point with vintage wine so that you don't want to take, I mean, they can, but tasting the same every year is kind of boring. You're supposed to like really get into each vintage has its uniqueness, but champagne, they want to keep it the same. It's kind of the first place that ever did something like that, like, you know, Coke is always the same no matter what, right? Anyway, um, so no more than 8% of the harvest can be used for the production of vintage champagne. Uh, in other words, at least 20% must be held back in reserve. Uh, this is only for houses. Yeah, I already covered that. Now, however, if you create a vintage champagne, at least 85% of the grapes for a vintage champagne must be from that year. Okay, so it sounds like a contradiction in percentages, but what we're saying is that you can have up to 15% of the vintage champagne be from a different vintage, okay? And here's another side note. That's kind of a, a, a general rule for all vintage wine. Vintage wine doesn't necessarily, now some places it has to be, 100% from that vintage. But in general, you can have a 2010 wine and a small percentage of it can actually be from a different vintage, just so you know. Uh, but in fact, most of it's usually 100% that vintage. But a lot of laws allow a little bit of leeway. Um, so 85% of the grapes in a particular vintage of wine or champagne has to be from that year. Okay? So they can use up to 15% from another vintage. All right. So this is non-vintage, by the way, like we just talked about. Uh, since 1842, there's only been 69 vintages of Moet. Now, each house can determine whether they want to declare a vintage or not. It's not champagne goes, we're having a vintage today or this year. Each, each house can say, we're going to do a vintage. And maybe another house says, well, the harvest wasn't that great, so we're not going to do a vintage this year. So they only had 69 of them since 1842. They only declare them in exceptional years. Now, this one doesn't have as much of the bakery smell. Oh, I forgot to say why I bought this. I bought this in anticipation of the Spurs winning their championship. Matter of fact, I bought it, I believe, the day of game five or the day of game six. It might have been day of game six on the way home to work. Yeah, we saw how that worked out. I just now opened it. So, obviously, the Spurs didn't pull through. Really heartbreaking championship. I mean, it was a great Great championship. It just obviously would have been better if the Spurs won, if you're a Spurs fan. If you're a Miami Heat fan, you loved it. Anyway, not as much bakery, but a little bit there. Um, honestly, the, 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 the bouquet is really more muted. Um, it's almost as, as muted as the uh, Prosecco. Maybe not as much. It's, just, it's kind of in between. 
I don't get as much of an apple or a pear or an apricot or anything like that. I mean, it's kind of there, a little citrus, but it's really more really a subtle, um, a subtle bread, yeasty type of, that's a really good way to describe it, yeast type of uh, aroma. Color isn't as golden as the Schramsberg, but then again, this is not 100% Chardonnay. You do have the other grapes in there. Let's check it out. It's smooth. That's really the first thing that kind of comes to mind. It's not as acidic, even though my mouth is really watering. It does, it's not as tart. It's not as tart as the Schramsberg. Um, but it's definitely got more flavor or feels more flavorful than the Prosecco. It's kind of, honestly, it's kind of in between. Oh, how much is the Moet? Um, I bought it at, <coughs> uh, who did I buy it from? Since I wasn't planning on reviewing the wine, I didn't keep the receipt. Um, I bought it from uh, Twin Liquors. And uh, so I had to look up the price. It's anywhere between 37 to 40 bucks, depending on where you buy it. So not hugely expensive. Um, it, it looks fancy, but it's you know a good value, honestly. Now, if you get some, you get their vintage stuff or some of their other stuff, it's going to be pricier. Like the rosé wines. I mean, rosé sparkling wines are awesome. You know, it's. It's really, all the flavors are just feel like they're just not as powerful. Um, it's it's nice, it's pleasant. Um, I get a lot more of the apple now. Um, it really kind of drinks like a Chardonnay. Um, granted, you know I know the bubbles aren't all. I bet you there's a lot of people out there going, can't believe he's not using the flute. Why is he using a regular wine glass? Fine. Here we go. All right. Now we can see the bubbles. I can't really swirl it so much. How anything should be concentrated anyway. I <laughs> feel like I just stuck my nose in a glass of Coke with all the <laughs> hitting your nose. didn't change the flavor for me, but it's pleasant. It's nice. It's smooth. Um, it's not as tart as the Schramsberg. So if you don't like really tartness, I'd definitely go with this. Um, it feels elegant. Maybe because I know I'm drinking champagne. Maybe in my mind, I'm like, this is supposed to be the best of the three or the most, this is the most expensive of the three wines. Um, but it feels a little elegant. It feels, I don't know, just nicer. But, I'm sorry, but the flavors aren't just leaping out at you. This is definitely something where you're in a, you're in an, you're in a an environment that you're having a great time and the wine is not taking center stage. The wine is there to enhance your experience rather than be the, the main player, the, the, what everyone's going to talk about. Oh, the wine's awesome. It's more like, hey, wasn't uh, blah, blah, blah awesome? Oh, here, cheers, okay? Uh, whereas the Schramsberg really feels to me more like it, 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 it's asking for more attention. When you drink it, it's kind of like, hey, whoa, don't forget about me, okay? How many of you thought of the Simple Mind song? It's definitely got a good flavor, just the, I would say the, the finish is a little shorter. Um, 38 to $40, it's impressive. You're gonna like it. You're, 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 I don't, you're not gonna be disappointed by it. I don't think I've ever been disappointed by Moet ever, okay, when I've had it. I've always been like, oh, this is nice, I like it, it's really tasty. Um, but I'm gonna say I like the Schramsberg probably the best of the three. 
just for my palate. Um, and it's about 10 bucks cheaper. So, uh, but it's, it is an American sparkling wine. So if you want like the good stuff, not the good stuff, the real stuff, I'm not saying these aren't real, but if you want the regular champagne or like want champagne and oh yeah, get the Moet. Um, I've had some grower champagnes that I would say are equivalent to this um, in the same price range, maybe a little bit cheaper or a little more expensive. And that's kind of a, it's been somewhat of a fad or a rage for, for a few years. Um, just got, you just got to go look for those. And like I said, there's, there's special two letter, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's up on the top somewhere. It's supposed to be on here somewhere. And I, I like I said, I have never, not that I look every time, but I've never noticed the two letter um, abbreviation that tells you what kind of champagne it is. Maybe it's just that not every champagne does it, but I swear it's supposed to be on everyone. But, oh well, someday I'm gonna find it and then I'm gonna hit myself in the head that it's been on every bottle and I just never noticed it. By the way, Dom Perignon did not invent champagne. He helped with the production. He helped, he helped with making it the way it is now. And a lot of it was based upon his harvesting and growing methods. Ooh, I should have left it go a little longer. But he did not invent it. He was actually hired to kind of initially be like, hey, why are these bottles exploding in, in the spring? Because that was when the second fermentation would happen. And they hired him to kind of figure out what was going on and prevent it or at least control it. So he did not invent it. Somebody else invented it prior to that. Yeah, I just kind of like the aroma better on the Schramsberg. That's going to do it. I just want to thank everybody. Um, the year's been... Um, had some good things happen, had some not so great things happen in my personal life. Um, I want to thank everybody that's been uh, around, that's been watching me, um, that's been uh, supportive of me, um, whether it's been individuals or companies, whether it's wineries, wine bars, uh, people in social media, uh, friends, personal friends that I actually you know know and, and see outside of this whole thing or just the people that I interact with on the internet. Uh, everybody who watches, I just want to just thank you all again. Um, at my day job today, the subject came up because apparently my staff watched some of my videos recently. And um, I let them know how many people actually watch these videos. And they were kind of surprised. Um, I get a lot of views. Now, I don't get, I don't have tens of thousands and 20,000 20, views or anything, but I get a lot of views. And through, diff through different... Uh, uh, ways, whether it's through everything through Blip TV, and uh, that would be everything on the website or in iTunes, uh, TiVo, um, let's see, well, though, and YouTube, well, YouTube, I'm on YouTube, off, if you don't know that, but Blip sends my stuff to YouTube. Um, <clears throat> but um, so all the views I get from that, um, which are phenomenal. Then um, iFood TV, again, I cannot thank. The people at iFood.tv enough. They promote me almost every time I've got a video uh, put on their homepage uh, for at least a day. Uh, like this was probably on there. Um, Christmas was. Uh, the people who work there have great turnaround time. If I ask something, I usually get excellent, almost instant responses via email. Um, their Roku channel, I get a ton of views off of that, off of Roku. Even though I have a Roku feed on Blip, Apparently, people find me on, on iFood TV. So I want to thank them uh, and everybody else who's watches. So everybody, it's been an awesome year. Um, I didn't get accomplished a lot of things. I, well, some of the things I wanted to accomplish this year, we're going to accomplish some things next year. Episode 300 is going to be coming up. Probably another three-ish months, maybe it's in April. But um, look forward to that. And I uh, hope if I do a live show that you can, if you're in town or you're in the, in the area, you can stop by and experience it. Um, but then again, it's a very equal chance that I'm going to do the 300, 300th episode from this table and probably have more sparkling wine or have some special wines uh, for that. But um, again, thank you. Uh, 
just because more than one person watches is, is why I do this. And uh, one of the things for next year is a recommitment to the website, a recommitment to doing the videos on a more regular basis um, in preparation for uh, the advanced sommelier test, which I hope to take in 2015. Uh, part of it's an invitation, but part of it is just being prepared for it, which it's going to take me at least two years to be, I think, I think really ready to take that level and it might take me a little longer, but we'll see. Uh, but the website is, part of the website is for studying for tests and I hope to uh, do that soon or at least in a couple years. It's going to do it for this episode for this year. Um, we'll see everyone again in 2014. I hope everyone has a great New Year's. Be safe. Don't get too stupid drunk. If you are, don't drive. <laughs> Hopefully you're at a hotel or just take a cab or a bus or a train or whatever. How are you going to, or someone's designated driver. So be safe So because uh, we want to make sure that you make it into the next year. Salute. <laughs>